Okay, folks. I see some familiar faces here. So how many of you were in my corporate finance class last year? Not as many as I thought be. So for many of you, this is going to be your first class with me, I would think. So let's see how this goes. Um, just to get you set for how this class will be structured, at the start of every class, there will be a quiz. Don't worry, it won't be graded. It won't affect your overall grade. You know what the quiz will be about? It's about the sub stuff we will do during the course of the class, which sounds like it's backwards, right? This quiz should come after. The, the point of the quiz is to actually raise questions about what we're going to talk about during the course of the class and let you get a chance to actually see if you can come up with the answer, in which case you're saying, you know, what's the point of the class? And I would like that to be the end game. Is much of what we're going to talk in the class, you could have figured out by yourself, having this class might prov provide you a structure, but we're gonna start every class with a quiz. So since we're gonna do that every class, I thought we'd start this class too with a quiz. You know, this class, it's called valuation now, and there's a story behind that. I'll come back and talk about that. But I want to get a sense of why you're taking the class, or what do you expect to see in the class? And I'm gonna structure it in, in, the, in the form of a, you know, a bunch of questions I'm gonna ask you. So here's the first one, and we'll come back and talk more about this. But you often see people talk about valuation as an art, as a science, accountants claim that they've made it more scientific. So my first question, and don't, you don't have to tell me the answers. I said, we'll come back and talk about it. If I asked you to describe valuation as a discipline, would you describe it as a science? And I let you def define what comprises a science. Is it an art? Is it black magic, white magic, whatever magic you want to call it? Or is there something else, some other word you'd use to describe it? So file that away. We'll come back and address that question sometime during the course of the class. Everybody made a choice? Art, science, magic, something else. Second, when you go into evaluation class, you have a preconception about what kinds of companies you're going to value. Okay. And I'm going to give you, a, you know, four groups of companies, and I want you to think about which of these companies is going to be easiest to value, and which ones you think will give you the biggest payoff to doing valuation. Two separate questions. Which ones are going to be easiest to value, and which ones will give you the biggest payoff to doing valuation? So here are the four, four groups of companies. The first are, is a mature company in a nice, stable market, nice, stable economy. That's your first choice. Second is a mature company in an emerging market, in an unsettled market. It doesn't even have to be emerging. It could be a developed market going through a crisis. The third choice is a young company. And I'll let you think about what a young company looks like in terms of revenues and earnings and financials in a nice, mature, in a nice stable economy. And the fourth choice is a young company in an unsettled market. Let's, uh, let's start with the two extremes. Which of these four groups of companies is going to be easiest to value? Anybody want to give that a shot? Yes. First one. And why? Because um, you can see what their cash flows have been in the past, and you can use that to measure or value potential. You have a lot of crutches, right? You have historical data, you have a business model, you have lots of opinions. You know what the company does, you know how it makes money. And that's where traditional valuation classes tend to spend most of their time on. You value Coca-Cola over and over again for 15 weeks, and you feel really good because you feel you've mastered valuation. One of the things I'm gonna argue in this class is anybody can value Coca-Cola. You give me a 10-year-old, a jar of candy, in about an hour, I can teach a 10-year-old enough valuation to be able to value Coca-Cola. In fact, I probably don't even need a person. I could probably automate the process not talking chat GPT kind of automation, just very basic Excel automation, and it can value Coca-Cola. Which of the four groups of companies is going to be most difficult to value? Yes. The fourth one. Why? 
uh, lack of stable historical data and uh, too many variables they found out. It's too much uncertainty, right? What's the reaction to uncertainty as human beings? We go into denial, we push it away, we outsource it. And most of the time we say, you cannot value companies when there's too much uncertainty. You saying, but VCs do it all the time. VCs don't value companies, they price. VCs can't value a $20 bill in a brown paper bag if you put it in front of them. They price companies. I'll talk about the contrast between valuing something and pricing something because it's, it's going to be something I come back and harp on. You're going to be tired of me drawing that contrast by the end of the semester. But I think it's healthy for you as investors, as analysts, as anybody involved in this process to recognize what you're doing. Are you valuing something? Are you pricing it? Which brings me to my third and final question. And this is something, again, where I don't expect a right or a wrong answer. I want you to look inward. Each of us has a strong side and a weak side. And I know there's a legend of a left brain and a right brain. I've been told that that's not, that's mythology, but let's stay with that. There's a left brain, there's a right brain, there's number side and a story side. I want you to think about which of those two sides is your strong side? Are you more comfortable working with numbers? Or are you more comfortable telling stories? You're saying, how would I know? You've known for a long time. How can you not know? I'll tell you when I knew I was about 12 years old. I was in my first English literature class and was asked to read Moby Dick. And I did. I was a good kid. I came prepared for a discussion of whales and captains. And about 20 minutes into the discussion, I realized they weren't talking about the whale. So I put up my hand and said, when are we going to talk about the whale? And the instructor said, there is no will. And I said, did I read the wrong book? I don't distinctly remember a big fish running all the way through the book. And she said, it's a metaphor. My jaw dropped. <laughs> and the rest of the class was about hidden meanings and things I didn't even know I had a meaning in the first place. I remember coming out of the class with a singular conclusion. I said, never again am I going to subject myself to that kind of bullshit. <laughs> And the rest of my school life was laid out in front of me, right? I avoided the literature classes like the plague. It was algebra one, algebra two, algebra three out of high school. And these were the good old days. You know what college looked like in the good old days? You went to college and you picked courses you wanted to take. As opposed to what? As opposed to this crappy core curriculum they make you take today. You know what I'm talking about? You gotta take a history class, why? It'll make you a rounded individual. No, it's got nothing to do with rounding you. You know why you need to take a history class? Because if you did not do it, there would be no need for a history department in the first place, right? I mean, who voluntarily says, I want to take 15 history classes? And then you got a numbers degree, accounting, engineering. And then you had a numbers job. And who do you hang out with? Other numbers people dangerous place to be when you hang out with people who think just like you. We'll talk about some of the delusions that come in when you're a numbers person, more as we go on through the class. But some of you are numbers people like me. But there are other people in that class who like this storytelling side, who like seeing hidden meanings. They took literature one, literature two, literature three. They went on to become history majors at Yale. They graduate, they discover that even Yale history majors don't make much money. You have poverty stricken wages as a journalist or whatever. And then four years later, you say, I'm sick and tired of living like this. And guess what? You're in this room right now, right? <laughs> There's some recovering number crunchers and recovering storytellers in this room. My guess is more storytellers and number crunchers because there's always a self-selection bias. The storytellers gravitate towards a strategy class because you can tell story after story after story. Nobody checks your story. You can tell fairy tales, build castles. Everybody's happily ever after. But my guess is there are still people in this class who are more naturally storytelling people. So I want you to classify yourself on your stronger side. And then I want you to think about which skill do you think matters more when you value companies? You might say the answer is obvious. Valuation is all about numbers. But one of the things I'm going to talk about today is how you need both sides working, stories and numbers. So with that lead in, let me close this up. And as I said, every session, we're going to start with this kind of test. So So 
let's talk about this class. We first talk about me. Why? Because I like talking about me. I came to NYU in 1986. I can tell I'm getting old. The other uh, last semester, last year when I taught this class, I got in the elevator. Student gets on, who's an MBA. And she says, my mother took your class. <laughs> I said, okay, that's nice to know. I'm glad it wasn't your grandmother because then I know I should be retiring. Yeah? 1986, lifetime ago. And when I first came to NYU, I was given a class to teach. It's a class called security analysis. You've heard of this class? Class with a long and hoary tradition. The class was started in the 1950s at Columbia University by a guy called Ben Graham. You might have heard of him. If you haven't, you've heard of his most famous student. You know who I'm talking about, right? The Voldemort of business or Warren Buffett, basically, he who shall not be named. <laughs> it's a class with a long tradition. They give me this class and they say, you should need to teach this class. I take one look at the class and I'm not teaching this class. Most boring class ever. Because by 1986, it was showing its age. It was four weeks on stocks and three weeks on bonds and two weeks on options and futures and five weeks on institutional detail. Like what? There was an entire session on listing requirements for the New York Stock Exchange. Teaching was so easy in the days before Wikipedia. You could actually come to class. These are the dozen listing requirements, go through the whole class. Everybody took everything down and thought you were a genius. If I tried that today, you'd be checking Wikipedia while I'm talking, saying, I can see it right here. Why is he talking about it? So I went to the head of my department and said, I want to teach this class. He should have fired me on the spot. But he's a good guy. He said, what would you like to teach instead? I said, I'd like to teach a valuation class. He said, don't do it. There isn't enough stuff in valuation to fill a class. And you know what? He was absolutely right. In 1986, there wasn't enough stuff in valuation to fill a class. There were no books on valuation unless you wanted to go with security analysis by Ben Graham. Do you know when that was written? Anybody want to guess the year it was written? 1934 was the first edition. I want you to remember that. When you read security analysis, it is a product of the times. You came out of the Great Depression. What was the first and biggest mission you had in investing? It was safety, right? You had to protect yourself. And that runs all the way through the book. It's not a good thing or a bad thing, but it it drives how Ben Graham talks about valuation. So what? So guess what he likes? He likes phone companies that pay big dividends. You gave him Tesla, he's going to freak out, right? But I really, really wanted to teach this class. And I discovered very early in my university life that if you want to get anything done at a university, this is advice you should take. The best way to do it is to not ask for permission. Because if you tried to ask for permission and approval, you know what would happen, right? A committee will be created. You know what happens in committees get created? You might have experienced committees. They meet and they meet and they forget what they're meeting about and they keep meeting. And then they have baby committees that they call subcommittees and sub-subcommittees. It's all very incestuous. They report to each other. And 35 years later, they come back and say, you can teach the class, but I'd be too old to do it. So I said, okay, I'll teach you security analysis class. And I walked into the classroom, shut the door, and taught evaluation class. Remember, this was 1986. There were no cameras in the classroom. They had no idea what I was doing inside the room. I could have been teaching cooking for 15 weeks. And as long as I gave everybody A's, nobody would complain, right? You know how long it took them to catch on? In 2008, I get a call from the dean's office. We hear you're teaching evaluation class. I said, yes, I've been doing it for 22 years. <laughs> I said, we don't see it listed anywhere in the course listings. I said, that's easy to explain. I've been hijacking all these other classes you've been giving me and teaching valuation instead. For 15 years, they made me teach a class called Equity Instruments and Markets. I don't have the least amount of interest in instruments. I don't care much about markets. I'm not that enamored with equity in the first place. That kind of leaves me with nothing to do, right? So I filled with valuation. 
They said, that's not right. We should call it valuation. I said, I agree. If you look at NYU's course listings, valuation shows up for the very first time in 2008. It's almost like it caused the market crash. I mean, they called it valuation. But this semester, I'm teaching two sessions of valuation, one to you and one to the undergraduates right after. I teach exactly the same class to both groups. It'll be my 59th and 60th semester teaching valuation. I'm gonna say something about this class that's gonna encapsulate how I think about valuation. Everything I know about valuation, I've learned in the course of teaching this class. Let me repeat that again. Everything I know about valuation, I've learned in the course of teaching this class. Not, I didn't know it when I walked in. I'll give you a few examples. One year into teaching this class, it was the fall of 1987, specific date, October 19th of 1987. It was a Monday. I was teaching this class. At that time, NYU's graduate school, business school was downtown, right next to the American Stock Exchange. I finished teaching my class. I come back to my office. I look out of my window and I see that everybody in the exchange floor is out on the street. I said, what happened? Maybe a fire alarm went off. You know what happened on October 19th of 1987? Anybody remember in history? Yes. On that one day, the S&P 500 dropped 22%. I want you to think about what a day like that would look like today. If the Dow dropped 22%, be what, 8,000 point drop? You'd all freak out, right? And people were freaking out. The reason they were on the street is they could not get their trade. Remember, these were the days of physical trading. They could not get the trades through on the floor. It was too confusing. It was a one day bear market. <clears throat> Wednesday, I'm in front of my class and guess what the first question I'm asked is? How with your valuation tools, can you, it's all about you. At this point, nobody wants to take ownership of anything in valuation because they've decided this is pointless. Do you explain a 22% drop in the market in one day? And I'd be lying if I said I knew the answer. But I said, okay, let's think about it. Let's think about what causes. And that started me on the process of understanding market crises. What happens during market? It's not like your cash flows change in two minutes or two hours. It's a price of risk changing. But what I started thinking about on that day on October 19th of 1987 stood me in good stead when the dot-com bust came, when 2008 came, when 2020, the first quarter of 2020 when COVID hit. It's something I've gone back to over and over again. And each time you do it, you understand a little bit more about market crises. You move 10 years forward. I still remember the day somebody in my class puts up their hand and said, have you ever heard of this company called Amazon.com? It's an online book retailer. I said, okay, that sounds interesting. I don't even know what that means. But let's try valuing the company. I valued Amazon for the first time in 1997. And I still tell people, everything I know about valuing young startup companies or young companies, I learned in the process of valuing Amazon. So you see my, read my Tesla valuation from three days ago you see the imprints of what I learned when I valued Amazon, when I started. Because when I first valued Amazon, I went through every textbook on valuation, including my own. And there was nary a mention of how to value companies with lots of potential, small revenues and big losses. It had never been done before because it was not something that valuation people thought would ever cross their path. Then you get to 2008. And you got a market crisis, a market crisis created by banks behaving badly. And I remember the question again in class, when yeah. banks behave badly, why are the valuations of all other companies affected? We have to talk about the side costs or what happens when financial service companies behave badly. Then you got to the first quarter of 2020. Remember COVID hits, the entire global economy shuts down. An experiment we'd never run before where the entire global economy had shut down and people had no idea what would happen if you tried to start it up again. I was teaching this class then. In fact, I remember March 6, I get this email from NYU saying, go home, we'll be back in three weeks. There's this virus floating around. We went home, we were definitely not back in three weeks. But the class continued on Zoom. 
And on March 23rd of 2020, the absolute bottom of that COVID market meltdown. People were just basically giving up and running for the hills. I chose to value Boeing in class. And the reason I picked Boeing, it was in the epicenter of the crisis, right? It's clients or it's customers or airlines and airlines are not flying. They're not buying aircraft. And the question was, will Boeing make it? What's the risk here? And I said, look, let's do this now. And they said, why can't we wait for the crisis to pass? That's always the response you get, right? Once Brexit is done, then we can value UK companies. You got to invest in the market you're in, not the market you wished you were in. You can't wait out crises because your best chances at valuing companies and finding good bargains might be during a crisis. And during the last decade, we had the phenomenon of what I call the numbers company. Let me explain. We look at a company like Facebook. It's the most impressive number about Facebook. Not the amount of money it's spending on the metaverse. I mean, that's an impressively bad number. But let's think about the impress. It's not the revenues. It's not, I mean, lots of companies have revenues higher than Facebook. It's got high margins, but Philip Morris has even higher margins. Apple has higher margins. What's the most impressive number about Facebook? Three billion people in its ecosystem. Think about it. It's mind boggling. If you combine Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, you've got three billion people. One out of every two adults on the face of the earth is on the Facebook ecosystem. You think, so what? Nine, I think it was 2017, somebody in the class, and, and if you think about a company like Netflix, what's the most impressive number? The number of subscribers, not the margins, not how much money they make. 2017, in this class, I've always started in this room, so it's in this room. I don't even remember which row it was. Somebody put up there and said, can you value a Netflix subscriber? Notice the question. It wasn't, can you value Netflix? Because that you can value the traditional way, revenues, margins. Can you value a Netflix subscriber? And I said, why not? I'm stupid enough to keep falling into this trap saying, why not? But the next two weeks, I developed an infrastructure to value a Netflix subscriber. And it's not rocket science, right? Somebody help me out. If I wanted to value a Netflix subscriber, what is the information I would need to do that valuation? Yes. First is I need to know how long a subscriber stays on, which is a function of churn rates. Already you can see things you don't talk about in tradition. What's a churn rate? It's a percentage of people who re-up each year. That number is like 95% for Netflix, partly because people once they start subscribing to Netflix, forget they've subscribed and they keep subscribing for the rest of eternity. So let's say it's 15 years. What's the next step? What do I need next? So let's assume this is an existing customer. And that's fairly straightforward, right? It's basically, what is it? $21 if you get the premium subscription with an inflation rate or whatever you want to build. And so I get expected subscriptions for the next 15 years. I have to net out some costs. There must be some direct costs associated with servicing subscriptions. You think, what about content costs? It's not at the subscriber level, right? But if you were valuing a Spotify subscriber, it is. You know why? What is it about Spotify that makes it different from Netflix in terms of content costs? Yeah. They, license, uh, content. they both license the, you know, Netflix license the content, it pays a upfront fee, it's a fixed cost. Whereas Spotify, you know how you pay for content? They pay to the artist based on the number of- Based on number of streams. This is, so basically if they have lots of subscribers and everybody's streaming Taylor Swift, the cost goes up. Already you can see it makes you think about business models that you wouldn't have thought about. But a value to Netflix subscriber. And then from that, you can value Netflix as a company, right? You can multiply by the number of subscribers. And then with new subscribers, you can bring in the cost of acquiring. It. And I'm glad I did that because that framework, I used to value Spotify. I used to value Amazon Prime as a standalone. And I used to value an Uber rider. Much messier than a Netflix subscriber, right? Because there, it's not the same amount for you. You have heavy Uber users and light Uber users. You got to figure out what the average Uber rider spends on those rides. But these are things, I, so in 2010, I wasn't thinking about the value of a user subscriber. 
So when you think about what, what, what drives this process, it's about what's happening. So in 2023, what will happen? 2022, I revisited an old friend, an old friend revisited me for a long time in the US and Europe. We've forgotten about inflation, right? Inflation is like this forgotten stepchild. Or actually, it's more like a middle child who always delivers good grades. You never worry about the child. So after all, you stop thinking about inflation. 2022, we're reminded that that middle child can have all kinds of addiction problems. And all of a sudden, you've got a problem, child. It's amazing how people have forgotten what inflation can do to valuation and how to deal with inflation and valuation. So long story short, this class is basically a summation of experiences that I've kind of tried to structure and present in a way saying, this is what I've learned so far in valuation. It's a long way to go. But welcome to the journey because at the end of this class, you might learn what I've learned over the last 36 years, but you need to keep learning. This is a process. It doesn't end when this. So if you're thinking you're going to master valuation by the end of this class, I mean, I would have, you know, I, I would love to know how you got there because I am not, I, I, I'm not even close to being there in terms of thinking about what valuation is all about. So that long lead in, let's talk a little bit about the logistics for the class. My office is on the ninth floor of the next building. So, you know, I list out office hours, we're back to physical office hours. So I will Zoom the office hours as well in case you're still not comfortable being in an office. My email address is probably the easiest and most direct way of getting to me. I don't answer my phone, so if you call my number and leave a message, the voicemail is so full that I don't even know how to check the voicemail anymore. It's a very elaborate system, so don't do it. Okay. My office hours are basically right before this class. So I will set up, as I said, the Zoom link to you. And the two teaching it's in Bunsi, who was just here, and Rakesh, both took this class last year, so they know exactly what's involved in this class. They will have office hours, and I'll list out their office hours. They'll also do a review session each week where they cover problems from past quizzes related to the material of that. So with that lead in, let's talk about what this class is about. What I'm going to say for the next 30 minutes to me is the most critical part of this class. Everything else is icing on the cake. A strange way to, to introduce a class because I'm saying after the first class, nothing else matters. It's not what I'm saying. After the first class, everything else is going to build on what we're going to say in this class. So I'm going to list out what drives this class in the form of a, a few themes that are going to run through the class. Here's the first one. I asked you about was, is uh, valuation an art or a science? Let me revisit that question. Is valuation a science? A tough question to answer. So let me reframe the question to make it simple. Is mathematics a science? Do you want to try? Is mathematics a science? It's the only pure science. In fact, mathematicians are convinced that the rest of us are imposters. So let me follow up. What is it about mathematics that makes it a science? It's you're either right or you're not. Two plus three is, help me out, what's two plus three? Five. Left hand, right hand, North Pole, South Pole, calculator, computer, supercomputer. It's the same answer. It's not, it might be five, it could be five. It is five. You get the inputs right, you get the output right. If you get the output wrong, you must have done something wrong. So let me reframe the question now in terms of valuation. If that is what makes for a science that you get the inputs right, you get the output right. Mathematics is a science. Physics is mostly a science. Laws of gravity are the laws of gravity. Does valuation have any chance of being a science? That's the question I'm asking you. You work really hard to value a company. You do everything you can do. You collect all the data on the face of the earth that you can get on the company. You talk to every management in the company. You talk to every equity research analyst. You talk to experts. You bring in all your valuation tools, you use them right. You value the company. What is the likelihood that you're going to get the right answer? Zero. You know why? Because you're trying to forecast the future. Let's say you valued a hotel business, Marriott, in 2019. You did everything right. You know what you forgot to incorporate in your valuation? 
that six months later, the whole world had shut down and nobody would be in a hotel. If you knew COVID was coming in 2019, there's probably somebody in a court system somewhere who needs to talk to you about how you knew that. But the reality is you could have done everything right, but you couldn't have forecast out that COVID was going to come in a few months, which made your entire valuation kind of defunct. Valuation is zero chance of being assigned. So the sooner we accept that, the healthier the discussion about valuation becomes. I mean, every week I, I get another email from some national appraiser group saying, we're going to try to make valuation more scientific. You know, I remember four years ago, I got this from the Indian government saying, we're working on creating a set of appraisal rules and principles to make valuation more. Would you be interested in serving on the panel? And I said, you can't pay me enough money to be on that panel because you're trying to do something that cannot be done. You're going to write a lot of rules thinking that's going to make your valuation better. But guess what? It's not going to change a thing. Valuation is not and has never been a science. So it must be an art, right? Let's break that apart. Let's again make the question simpler. Is painting an art? I'm not talking about painting your house, but painting portraits, painting, paintings that hang in the mat. Yeah. I still remember when my oldest son was eight years old. He's now 32, so it's been a long time. He's actually 33, so it's, he's actually aging as I talk. No. <laughs> I took him to the Met to, watch a, to see a Picasso exhibit that was going through. So he lasted about 30 minutes, which is pretty impressive for an eight-year-old in a museum. So he come out 30 minutes later and ask him, hey, Ryan, what did you think of that exhibit? He said, Dad, I was not impressed. He said, what? It's a Picasso exhibit. He said, this guy can't get the nose in the right place. You notice about Picasso's, the nose comes out of the side of the head, the top of the head, the back of the head. It's almost like he was drunk or drugged, which given Picasso's history is probably both. But for whatever reason, we've gathered together and said, that's special. Great artists are born, you can't teach them. You can teach paint in the numbers kind of art, but you're not going to get, you know, you can turn out all the impressionist paintings you want, but nobody's paying a hundred million dollars for your painting. The essence of an art is you cannot teach it. Thank God valuation is not an art because if it was an art, I wasted much of my life teaching something that cannot be taught. So it's not a science and not an art. What the heck is it? I'll give you the word I used to describe valuation. It is a craft. Now, I'll give you the discipline that I think is closest to valuation. It's cooking. Think of how you master cooking. You could watch the Food Network 24 hours a day. In theory, you can tell me how to make a souffle, but you try making it. I still remember when I first started cooking, they said whip the egg into a, you know, so that it has a top. I still remember, what the heck does that even mean? How do you whip an egg and how does it have a top? You could read every cookbook there is to read about cooking and you won't be able to cook. To learn cooking, what do you have to do? You actually have to cook. And the first time you cook, guess what happens? Fire alarms go off. Now, I still remember the first time I scrambled eggs. I, nobody told me you're supposed to spray the damn pan. I scrambled the egg. Great looking egg stuck to the pan. Pan and egg goes in the trash, but I learned a very important lesson about scrambling eggs. You learn cooking by cooking. And you're going to get better as you cook, but the first time you cook, don't expect miracles. Be ready to order out. You learn valuation by doing. Not So when you watch me talk about valuation, or you watch me do valuations, you might think you get it, but until you actually value companies, it's not going to stick. And I'm going to force you to value companies and as diverse a group of companies as I can get you to value during the course of the semester, because that's the way you're going to get better at valuation. It's going to take two forms. One is a project where you're going to value an individual company, but it's one company. But every week, I'm also going to put up what I call a valuation of the week. I'll give you a preview. Tomorrow, I'm going to put up my first valuation of the week. It's going to be my valuation of Tesla. And I'm going to emphasize the word my valuation of Tesla with a blog post explaining the valuation. And there's going to be a Google shared spreadsheet. You're saying, for what? 
I want to encourage you to try to value Tesla. And your reaction is going to be, but this is the first week of the class. I really don't know how to value companies. It's a change what you feel comfortable changing. Come up with a value, put it into the Google Shared Spreadsheet. I'll make a prediction. In week one, you're all going to agree with me and most of you are going to agree with me. You know why? You'll change the third decimal point in the risk-free rate. Everything else looks pretty good. I will leave it as is. I create histograms of what the Google spreadsheet valuations look like. And the first week or two or three, you get this column right on top of my valuation. But here's what's going to happen as you go through this class. You're going to get more and more comfortable disagreeing with me. That's a good thing. I want you to get to a point in week six that, that PZ Cousins Nigeria valuation you put up, terrible. I think your growth rate is off. Your value is off. And I'm so good. The class is working. So I'm going to take you on a path where we're going to start with Tesla. Then I'm going to go to PZ Cut. You've never heard of PZ Cousins Nigeria, right? It's a consumer product company in Nigeria. Then I pick a commodity company, BHP maybe. Then we'll come back and value Palantir. So each week I'll pick a company as different from the previous week because I want, and it's completely optional. I mean, people have often described this class as trying to drink out of a hose. You know, some of you are going to say, look, this is gagging me. I can't do it. And that's fine. You might say, this is too much for me. But I'd like you to think about valuing at least some of those companies because that's the way you get more comfortable with the tools and valuation. You're going to get better at the craft, but guess what? You never master a craft. There used to be this show called This Old House. It's a PBS show, one of the oldest home shows. It predates the home network. And there used to be a market master carpenter called Norman. I don't, I don't even know his last name on it. And he would say, look, you know, I know how to do these things. But to do this, I have to talk to somebody who's done, uh, who's, who, I have to learn. Same thing about valuation. You think you got, if you think you got the thing mastered, the market is waiting for you to get to that point because it's got a surprise waiting for you. It's a process. You keep working at it. You'll never quite master it, but you will get better at it. Let's move on to the second thing. I talked about this fixation I have about two words that should never, I think, be mixed up. One is the word value. The other is the word price. Let me give you the big picture perspective. We know, let me repeat that word again. We know what drives the value of a business or an asset. It's cash flows, growth, and risk. It's always been true. Now, you might use a discounted cash flow model and make estimates of those, and there we can have room for disagreement, but a value of a business always comes from cash flows, growth, and risk. That's what drives value. You know what drives price? It's demand and supply. Are you saying, aren't demand and supply driven by cash flows, growth, and risk? They could be, but they could also be driven by mood and momentum and revenge. You see, revenge? Early 2021, I think it was January 2021, it's a company called GameStop. <laughs> company that's actually a dying business because who goes into a mall in the first place anymore? And who goes into a game in a business selling games in a, in a mall? But that's their core business. And people bet on the fact that it was a dying business and go to zero. One of the most shorted stocks on the New York Stock Exchange. Stock had dropped from like $40 down to $11, $12, $13. When in January 2021, something very unusual and strange occurred. A group of people gathered together on Reddit and created the site called Wall Street Bets. And they decided that they were going to buy GameStop and push the price up. And did they succeed? You know what GameStop stock price went to, right? Anybody know what its high was? It actually got to $450. They made GameStop into, a, I think, a $100 billion company. And I said, what do they see that I don't? What is it that they see in the business models? I went on Wall Street bets. Don't go down that rabbit hole. It's very difficult to extract yourself. And I start looking for what's the story they're telling. And you know what the overwhelming emotion was that was driving people to buy? 
it wasn't that they thought the company had a great business model. There were a few mentions of Ryan Cohn from Chewy coming into the company, maybe online gaming. But the overwhelming reason they were buying is because they wanted to take revenge. Against whom? Hedge funds. Why? Because they had big student loans and they said, it's a hedge fund's fault. You need somebody to blame. And they said, this is who we're going to blame. We're going to push the price up to teach them a lesson. I'm not saying this is good, this is bad, but price is what it is. You think, but that's not rational. In fact, isn't revenge the most human? If you think about strong emotions, revenge versus rational valuation, revenge is going to win out every single time. Price is driven by cash flows, growth, and risk, but it's driven by mood and momentum. And in finance, we've known this for 50 years, right? There's an entire branch of finance that's dedicated to the idea that there are all these behavioral forces that drive how people react, and it's called behavioral finance. Behavioral finance doesn't affect the value of a company, but it can affect the price. It can drive the price away from the value and keep it away from the value for long periods. If you're asked to value something, you look at its cash flow, you look at the business model, you look at the cash flows growth. And if you're asked to price something, you know what you do? You look at what other people are paying for similar things. Hey, when you buy a house, Think of how you decide how much to pay. You don't do a discounted cash flow valuation of the house, I don't think. You look at what other people paid for. So that's pricing. Do people do sim something similar in equity markets? How do most equity research analysts decide when something is cheap or expensive? They look at the P ratio for the company. They compare it to 15 other companies. They look, this company is cheap, but this company is expensive. They're doing pricing. Using the word valuation to describe what you've just done when you used to multiple and comparables is malpractice. It needs to stop. It will not, but it needs to stop because it creates all kinds of strange misconceptions about value. So when a company goes from $400 per share to $20 per share, it's not that the value probably collapsed, the pricing collapsed. Let's be clear about what's happened. So we're going to spend a big chunk of this class talking about value because that's where my heart lies. But we're also going to spend about a third of this class talking about doing pricing better, because most of you, if you end up in jobs that you think are valuation jobs, really are pricing jobs. Bankers price companies, they don't value companies. Equity research analysts price companies, they don't value companies. So we're going to talk about how to do pricing better. Because I think that it's my job to make sure that that tool set is available to you because you can't be using a discounted cash flow model if your job is to price things. Now, what are we going to value? Just about everything. This is not a class about valuing large publicly traded companies. It's about valuing small publicly traded companies, not a class about valuing US companies alone. It's about valuing companies anywhere in the globe. It's not even about valuing public companies. It's about valuing private companies. In fact, it might not even about valuing companies at all. It might be valuing individual assets or even investments. And along the way, we're going to argue that there are some things that cannot be valued. Why? Because they don't have cash flow. What's the value of a Picasso? I have absolutely no idea. What's the price of a Picasso? Well, I could look at what other people pay for Picassos and make a judgment on what you pay for Picasso. Already, you can see that somebody asks you, is Bitcoin undervalued? They lost the script. Bitcoin cannot be valued. It's a currency, if it's a currency. If, and if it's a collectible, it still can't be valued. But either way, when you think about a currency, you can't value the US dollar. You can price it. In fact, what do we call that pricing? An exchange rate. You can think about the price of Bitcoin as an exchange rate between dollars and Bitcoin. And along the way, if we get a chance, we'll ask, is that a reasonable exchange rate? What am I getting when I have Bitcoin instead of dollars? It's a healthier discussion than going on a rabbit hole saying, let's value Picasso, let's value Bitcoin. So we're going to talk about pricing things like collectibles, maybe even real estate, which is an entirely pricing game. Nobody values real estate. How do real estate developers come up with the value to pay for the property. They might put in cash flows from rental income, but at the end, what do they do? They estimate what they can sell the building to somebody else for with a pricing judgment. And finally, I told you that valuation, we've got story people in this room and numbers people in this room. 
And I know right now, if you're a numbers person, you might say, I feel more comfortable. This is my turf. We're going to work with numbers. And if it's a story person, you're saying, what exactly am I going to do here? And I'm going to argue that a good valuation is a bridge between stories and numbers. See, what the heck are you talking about? When I show you valuation of a company, let's take Tesla. You know how much I projected as revenues for Tesla in 2032? See, any, anybody's read my blog? $400 billion. If you ask me, how did I come up with the $400 billion, Here's the answer you don't want to hear. If I told you I used to 25% growth rate for the first five years, 21% in year six, it answers nothing, right? It tells you nothing. When I use a $400 billion revenue for Tesla, I'm making, I'm telling you a story of Tesla becoming not just the largest car company in the world, because remember, Toyota and Volkswagen have what 280 billion revenues, but also having revenue streams from other businesses, software, carbon offsets. They made 1.8 billion from carbon offsets last year. Maybe AI. Maybe you know automated driving, but I'm telling you a story about a company that's going to be incredibly successful. I'm also telling you a story about people increasingly switching from traditional automobiles to electric vehicles around the world, and that's what I need to tell you. That's the story. When you see the margins for Tesla, the margins I estimated were 16 percent, and you should be skeptical. You know why? No car company makes 16 percent margins. Car companies make eight, even the very best car companies make eight, nine, 10% margins. So why is it 16%? The story I'm telling about Tesla is a company that's not just, I'm, I'm, a, I'm telling you a story of an electric car, not just being a car, but more electronic device, more iPhone than car, because that basically allows you to have higher margins. Could I be wrong on both? Absolutely. But that's a story that we can then debate. You can say, I disagree with that story. But as I told you, I used to 25% growth rate. How do you disagree? I'll use 30% growth rate. And that's a completely unhealthy discussion. Good valuations are bridges between stories and numbers. So when I show you a number, I always have to have a story that backs it up. And when you tell me a story about a company, I'm going to put you on the spot and say, where does it show up in the numbers? So you tell me your company has incredibly good management. I said, where does it show up in the numbers? Yesterday, I got somebody who didn't like my valuation. So where are you showing the mind-blowing capacity that Elon Musk has to come up with new products? I said, look, I can't play pay dividends with mind-blowing capacities. I've got to convert it into new products and new revenue streams. Why do you think I'm making Tesla one of the most successful companies in the world over the next 10 years? So when people talk about that's too subjective, it's too qualitative. It cannot be put into evaluation, then don't pay for it. Because when you pay for evaluation, do you pay with real dollars or with mind-blowing explosions of whatever you brought it. You got to pay with real money. So if you want to buy a company like Palantir, like Tesla, you have no, you have the obligation then to try to bring all of those factors in. I told you, I started as a number cruncher. For the first few years I taught this class, I taught it as a number cruncher, did, which is when in doubt, put up an equation. If you're still doubtful, put up a second equation. If the doubt lingers, make them simultaneous equations, solve for it, make you feel a lot better. It accomplishes nothing. It took me a while to realize that if I wanted to act on my valuation, that's going to be the next theme I'm going to talk about. I needed to be able to tell stories. And then teach myself storytelling. And one of the things I will try to during the class is take you through the process of how I try to connect stories, numbers. It's not the process that might work for you, but it's really about bringing in your weak side. I'll tell you my end game for this class. By the end of this class, if you're a storyteller, I hope you get comfortable enough with numbers that you can tell disciplined stories. Because storytellers tend to kind of wander off, right? They can make up fairy tales because there's nothing crimping you. I hope you develop enough discipline to tell disciplined stories. If you're a number cruncher, here's what I hope this class will deliver. That you will get to trust your imagination enough that you're willing to tell stories. Let your imagination go. To me, the essence of, of somebody's good at value, you're either a disciplined storyteller or an imaginative number cruncher. 
Guess which group I have trouble with every single semester I teach this class? Getting storytellers to develop discipline or number crunchers to let loose their imaginations. It's always a number crunches. You give me a hundred history majors, I can teach them enough valuation to be able to value companies in a week. Give me a hundred engineers, I'm screwed. <laughs> you know why? You've spent a lifetime bludgeoning your imagination to the ground because you've been told at every step that being telling a story without tying up every loose end is a sign of weakness. And I want you to kind of let loose on that. It, you know, it won't come naturally. You're going to feel uncomfortable because all these loose ends are going to be out there, but you got to get comfortable with that part of the process if you truly want to value companies. Which brings me to my final theme. I'm going to use a word that you probably did not expect in evaluation class. The word I'm going to use is the word faith. You say, what's faith got to do with it? You know what? I don't do valuation consulting. I've never valued a company for money. I don't do expert witness work in courts where you come in and say the value. So I, I, I don't do it not because I'm noble, but because I'm too lazy and too opinionated and I don't want to do it. But it does mean it leaves me with this vacuum of why exactly am I value companies? I value companies because I want to act on my valuations. You know what I mean by that, right? If I value a company and I find it undervalued, I want to be able to buy the stock. You're saying, what's the big deal? Think about it. Let's say, you know, you pick the company, you pick, you value the company, you come up with a value of 50, the stock price is at 35. This is a no-brainer, right? Just go buy the stock. But what might hold you back? First, you have to have faith in your valuation. And by then, you're going to realize how many assumptions you had to make to get to the $50. And you're going to say, well, I don't know that I'm right. And then you have to have faith that the price will adjust to value. Right? The 35 has to go to 50. You see why I use the word faith? What's the essence of faith? If you ask me to prove that your value is right, or if I ask you to prove the value is right, there is no way you can do it. If, I, if, I, if you ask me to prove that price will move to value, I can't do that either. Now, do you see why it's so difficult for people to actually use valuation investing? It's easy to value companies. It's difficult to develop faith because it doesn't happen overnight. That's one thing I can't teach in this class. I can take you through the process of how I got my faith. And I can also take you through the process of when my faith has been tested. I've always been uncomfortable with the Omaha view of investing, which is absolute, right? If you do it right our way, you're going to make money. I've never felt that, that, that absolutely sure about anything, which means my faith gets tested. I'll give you a very simple example. I valued Tesla on, I think, a week ago, right before its earnings report. Or actually, as the earnings report came out, the value it came up with was $130. Stock was trading at $143 then. You know what the stock is trading at right now? $172 right now. It's a market knocking on matters. Do you still have faith? That's what's going to happen. You buy a stock, you think it's undervalued, and the stock price drops even more. That's a market knocking on your door saying, do you still have faith? And don't tell me that you feel absolutely sure about it because there's something wrong with you. That's the case. It's natural if you have faith for that faith to be tested. And sometimes it's okay to say, I don't feel faithful enough to my valuation to hold on because that's a healthy reaction as well in investing. So let's talk about the preseason prep. It's too late for preseason, so the season's already here. No, but if your accounting is weak, your statistics is weak, your foundations of finance is weak, I discovered very early that just because you took a class in accounting or a class in statistics doesn't mean you get, quite get it. So I created my own versions of these classes. And they're very skewed versions because it's all about what do I need in my valuation class from statistics, from accounting. So don't show this to the accounting professor because he's probably going to freak out saying, that's not right. I don't care. This is about accounting from my perspective and valuation. It's about reading accounting statements and making sure that you do this right. 
So if you're if you find yourself at stages of this class finding yourself not quite sure what the difference is between you know total assets and invested capital, I would strongly encourage you to take the accounting class or at least pieces of it to make sure your accounting is solid. So it's completely optional again, and if you feel that it'll help you, go ahead and do it. Over the next 15 weeks, I am going to torture you pretty much every day for the next 15 weeks, you're going to hear from me. And I'll tell you how these weeks will play out. Monday, right after the class, so today, you know, around 5 or 5.15, you get an email, and all I'll do is say, this is what we did in class today. You're saying, but I was in class, it doesn't matter, I was just to remind you what we did in class today. Perhaps give you a couple of links in case you're interested. And there will be a post-class test and solution. Basically, it's a 10-minute test you can take to see, did I get what we covered in class today? On Tuesday, you get the valuation of the week. So tomorrow, expect an email with my Tesla valuation, my Tesla blog post, and the Google shared spreadsheet. And I will encourage you to use my spreadsheet, change the numbers you don't like. And so don't bitch and moan that you don't like my growth rate, you don't like my margin, just make it yours. Come up with the value, put it on the Google Shed spreadsheet. On Wednesday, you'll have class again on the email that will be sent out Wednesday. In addition to the post-class test and solution, there'll be a weekly challenge, completely optional, but basically take the material we did that week in class and take an extra step. So we talk about risk-free rates next week. I might ask you to estimate a risk-free rate in... Egyptian pounds. It's quite a challenge. But this is really to say, hey, do you get this? Can you extend this one more step? It's not just mechanical. On Thursday, I will nag you. Nag you about what a project that will run all the way through the semester that I'll talk about in a few minutes. We value company. The nag is going to be about where are you on the project. It's essentially to make you keep moving on the project. Most of you will not listen and do it all in the last two weeks, but nothing I can do about that. On Friday, I'll send you what I call evaluation tools of the week. Those of you in my corporate finance class, I did a separate set of sessions on in-practice webcast. But the valuation tools of the week, I'll basically take whatever we did that week and talk about, hey, practically, if I had to estimate a risk-free rate in Indonesian rupiah, where would I get the data? How would I use the data? So basically taking to the mechanics of doing something. On Saturday, you get an email with a newsletter on what we did during the course of the week. You say, why would I need a newsletter? It just happened. But large classes, especially as you go through the semester, there are going to be times that I have no idea what we did last week or where we're going. So the newsletter will tell you. On Saturday, Sunday, I will send you the solution to the weekly challenge. The weekly challenge, as I said, is optional. You don't have to turn it in anywhere. So I really don't, you know, don't keep track of who's doing it. It's up to you. But I'll send you the solution. You can compare it to your solution and see you know, why the answers might be different. Then Monday, you wake up and we'll repeat the process over and over again. I'll give you a break during spring break. I won't email you for that week. But outside of that week, every day, you're pretty much going to get an email from me. And if you don't get an email from me, then you should start thinking, about maybe there's something wrong with my email. I'm not getting emails in because, you know, that's unusual. Now, in terms of books, you don't need any textbooks for this class. You can use the lecture notes. I've sent you the link to the first packet. There'll be two more packets coming. Yeah. But if you do want to get a book. I have five books on valuation. There'll be a sixth book coming out during the course of the semester. There's only one of these that's a textbook, investment valuation. It's a grind. It's big. It's, you know, it's, it's involved in practice problems. So it's good for a class in terms of, but it's tough. It's a tough read. I, I don't want to read it, you know, start to finish. No. But I also have a book called The Modern on Valuation, which is more for practitioners. If you really like to value difficult to value companies, book I have called Dark Side of Valuation about value young companies, commodity companies, financial service companies, regulated companies. So basically, when you think about difficult to value companies, if you really don't have time to read and you want something cheap, there's a little book of valuation and it's really little. It kind of covers what I do in the other books in like 200 pages instead of 1,000 pages. And if you're really focused in on the story to numbers part of valuation, then I have a book called Narrative and Numbers. There'll be a sixth book that will show up sometime during the semester on the corporate life cycle. It's with the printer, it's going to come from Random House, so I'll tell you when it's available, about how to value companies all the way from young all the way into decline. Okay? If you have an Apple device, I also have an app called U Value on the App Store. 
which does an intrinsic valuation. So if you have an iPad or an iPhone, you know, you can download it. It actually, you know, 15 inputs or do an intrinsic valuation. And I'll put it up against any banking valuation of a company. It does a pretty good job. But it does come with a money back guarantee. You know why? It's free, which means you don't like it tough. You know, I don't care. No. Return the money you paid, which is zero. So, so think of it as something as an add-on that you can use if you if you if you kind of want to see what it looks like. And in terms of in, our, uh, in terms of staying connected, much of the stuff, almost everything in this class, the basic platform you should use is not Brightspace or a learning management system. It's the web page for the class. I've sent you the link multiple times. It's up there as well. So it'll have links to everything, the lectures, the webcast, the practice problems, past exams, everything is on that page. Yeah, the sessions will be, will have a Zoom link. The Zoom link, of course, creates a recording. I'll put the recordings up. I do convert the recordings also into YouTube videos. It sounds like overkill, but the advantage of YouTube is it kind of adjusts your bandwidth. So if you're in, a, in an airport and you have to watch a lecture and catch up, very difficult to download an MP4 file if you're on on airport Wi-Fi, but YouTube adjusts to bandwidth so you can watch it much more easily. And uh, every email I send to this class will go into this thing called the email chronicle. This is really for myself because there will be times in this class where you're going to say, I never got that email. How do you disprove something like that? So here's what I'm going to do instead. I'm going to put everything into the email chronicles, which means you have no reason for not being aware of what's going on in the class. So every email, and it'll build up. Right now, it's only three emails because that's all I've sent. But it'll build up over the course of the class to become you know, 20 pages long because that's what 114 emails will do to you. Now, piling on, there's a Google Calendar. You can check out when the quizzes are. There'll be three quizzes and a final, and I'll talk about that in a, li in a little while. Now, if you want more reading, as I said, much of what I do in real time goes on my blog. So right now, as you know, the Twitter post is up there. I'm just going to post this evening on what interest rates are in 2022. So it's kind of a framework for thinking about interest rates. And sometime in the next week, I want to write about this Indian company called the Adani Group, which is in the news right now because it's been targeted by a short seller called Hindenburg. It's a huge story even if you're not from India, because it is one of India's largest companies in terms of market cap. And because of the short selling story, it lost $50 billion in market cap on Friday. And I want, I know nothing about the insights of the company, but I want to talk about holding companies. And if you wrote on family group holding companies, family group holding companies with light float and family group holding companies with light float and political connections, why are you ever surprised that bad things can happen to you? Because you've, in a sense, loaded the dice here to everything that can make things go wrong. Something is going to go wrong. So keep your eye on the blog because almost everything you read there is relevant to this class. The you know, Twitter feed, I, I don't involve myself in Twitter fights, Twitter battles. The Twitter feed is really there to direct you to something I've already done, a blog post, a paper that I've written, a new spreadsheet that I put up. And finally, if you still have time in your hands, I don't see how you could have that. There are more readings that you can find on the webpage for the class. And I know you're all really focused still on grades. And you know this class, like every other finance class, has to follow a grading. I mean, the other disciplines might not, so strategy, marketing might do whatever they want, but we have a requirement that we... So I'm going to follow the same principles about A's and B's and C's, but here's what I'm looking for. Now, if you can value just about anything by the end of this class, then I'm looking to give you an A. If you can value most things, then a B. If you can value something, which is not asking for much, then you're a C. And if you can value nothing at the end of the class, and I've really screwed up and you've screwed up with me, no. which effectively means I've got to create a mechanism for coming up with that distinction. And here's what I will use. There will be three quizzes for this class that are, you know, that, that run through the semester and you can see the dates. They're open book, open notes. This is not about testing you on, do you remember an equation from page 73? It's about applying what we do in class. And every quiz and exam I've ever given an evaluation class is online. So, which means I've got to come up with an entirely new quiz. So don't use chat GPT 
to answer the quiz because it'll look at the old quiz and do the wrong thing because all I have to do is throw one little branch in there and it's going to screw it up. So essentially it's open book, open notes, and you'll have as much practice as you want because every past quiz is that. There will be a final exam in the week after class ends. So it can be in that final exam week. I don't know the exact date yet because I haven't specified it. The quizzes will be 10% each and the final exam will be 30%. And when you get a chance, read through the next page because it lists out the rules for quizzes. I'll, I'll cut through to the basic rules. It's open book, open notes, but it's your book, your notes, not the next person's exam in case that needed to be, you know, needed to be stated. But it also tells you what happens if you miss a quiz because there will be reasons to miss a quiz. There better be good reasons, right? You're sick, you got stuck on the subway, your spouse is sick, a child is sick, your dog is sick. And you know what? I'm not going to come in and check you. So if you tell me you're sick, I don't want a doctor's note because I will assume you're an adult. I'm an adult. You're not lying to me about this. But if you do miss a quiz, here's what's going to happen. The 10% gets moved to the remaining quizzes and the final. It's always going to get moved forward. You know why? Because otherwise you get strategic quiz miss, which is if you do really well in the first two quizzes, you miss the third quiz because it makes your quizzes worth more. And I played this game long enough to know the gaming that goes on. So it'll always get pushed into what's left. So there is really no strategically good reason to miss a quiz. You know, so if you can take the quiz, I would suggest you do. Now I will, as when I do open book, open notes, it used to be that I prevented electronic devices, but many of you will have your slides on a device. It could be an iPad. It might be even on your laptop. I will let you access the slides, but no Excel spreadsheets. It's for your own protection because if I let you use Excel spreadsheets, I'm going to up the game on the kinds of problems I'm going to ask you. And trust me, you don't want to go there and I don't want to go there. So Let's keep Excel out of the picture now. And essentially you can look, use the slides and you can use a calculator. You can use a calculator on your device, whatever you want to do. So, no. so that's basically everything about the class. Let me very quickly talk a little bit about the project. So what's the project? Project basically is going to force you to pick a company and both value it and price it. By now, you know the distinction. So we're going to make you value and price it. Now it's a group project and I'm going to let you find your own groups. Now I'm not going to be responsible for any of the group issues that come up, you know? So this way you pick the group, you handle the group, you deal with intra-group dynamics. I don't have the bandwidth to be able to do that. Now, each of you will pick a company to value. Let me be specific. So the groups can range anywhere from four people to seven, even eight people. I'm okay with that. But if you have seven people in the group, there will be seven companies being valued. Four people in the group, there'll be four companies being valued. Now, in my corporate finance class, the project is due on the last day of class and I kind of let it go because people work on their own timing. In this class, we have this small problem. Many, how many of you are second year MBAs? Okay. There's this phenomenon called premature graduation, which usually means around March, mentally you've already left the school. So, which means that after that, nobody can nail you down on anything on a project. So what I'm going to do is midway through the semester, I'm going to give you a one-time deal. It's March 31st on your intrinsic valuation part, you can turn in your valuation for feedback. It's not for grading. So that's really to encourage you to get working on the valuation early rather than later. Now, what are you going to do in the project? First, when you pick companies, within a group, I'm going to put some constraints across the group. At least one of your companies has to be money losing. Trust me, that's not tough to find now. So lots of money losing companies. You can pick any, you know, at least one to be money losing. At least one of your companies has to have high growth in terms of revenues, not income growth, but revenue growth. That's to get you valuing the Palantirs of the world and even the Teslas of the world saying high revenue growth. At least one of your companies has to be a non-US company. 
And I'd prefer you value the company in the local currency. If you want to pick a Nigerian company and value Nigerian Naira, that's exactly what I want you to do because I want you to get comfortable value companies in different currencies in different markets. And at least one of your companies may be a service company, might as well cross that requirement out because 90% of the world is service companies now. That's easy to make. Now, remember, one company can meet multiple constraints. You see how? You can have a money losing, high growth, emerging market company. So if you've got, say let's say you founded a group and there's some new person who wants to join in one way you can, you can create bargaining power. You can say, look, you can join the group, but you got to value the high growth, money losing emerging market company. Because let's face it, it is more difficult to do it. So if, if your objective is to minimize your work, you might avoid that company. But if you really want to learn valuation, that's basically where you should go. Right? So you're going to do an intrinsic valuation of your company. And we'll, we'll develop the tools over the course of the seven, eight, nine weeks, the first seven, eight weeks where you'll do this. So by the time you get to March 31st, you're going to turn an intrinsic valuation of your company. That intrinsic value can be higher or lower than the price. Your company can be under or over value. Once you're done with that though, I'm going to ask you to price your company. You think, what's the difference there? Pricing your company, you're going to look at other companies in the sector and say, you know, pick a multiple and com comparables, you're going to price your company. When you price your company, you might find it to be underpriced or overpriced relative to the rest of the market. I also have these market-wide pricing mechanisms where you can say, hey, my company is underpriced relative to software companies. Let's see how it's doing against the U.S. market. So you're going to price the company against the market. So at this point, you're going to have three numbers in your company an intrinsic valuation for your company, a pricing against a sector, and a pricing against the market. You think, so what? Last step in this process, uh, oh, actually, there's a fourth number you might get for some of your companies where I'm going to argue that some companies with contingent cash flows, a young pharmaceutical company with a drug working its way through the pipeline, an oil company with undeveloped reserves, the reserves are all very expensive to develop. You have an option. It's a very small subset of your companies. You might get a fourth number for your company, an option pricing value for your company. At this stage, you might be mystified. So what if I'm getting four different numbers? The final step of this, of this project, you're going to, I'm going to ask you to make a recommendation. And I'm going to give you two choices, buy or sell. No Weasley stuff. No strong buy, weak buy, semi-strong buy, you feel really uncomfortable. You either buy or sell, right? Some of you are going to be chicken and pick the hold, and I'm going to let you do it, but I'm going to try to push you off that hold. Now, do you see why I emphasize the point that you're going to get four different numbers? What if you find your company to be undervalued when you did your intrinsic valuation, but overpressed, or overvalued and underpressed? Say, so what do I do? You get to pick. Pick what? Pick which of those numbers you feel more comfortable with. There is no theoretical answer. Are you more comfortable with your pricing or your valuation? So that project is going to run all the way through. I want you to start thinking about groups you want to be part of and companies you would like to value. Pick a company that fascinates you. Don't pick a company because it's going to make your life easy. Pick a company that you've always wanted to get a number on. It could be Tesla, it could be Beyond Meat, it could be Lulu Lamont. Don't ask me what the fascination with that damn company. <laughs> Maybe every semester there are eight people valuing Lulu Lamont. About six people used to value Krispy Kreme, 10 people. Used to... I think you know what happens. People sit on their couch, they're watching Netflix, they're eating Krispy Kreme donuts. So what should I value? They look at the box next to the Krispy Kreme looks good. <laughs> Whatever the reason, pick a company that you feel you would like to get a value for. Right? This is not about a number that I'm going to use. It's a number you're going to use. And that's going to be the project for the class. As I said, it's going to run through the semester. It's going to be 40% of your overall grade. So something to think about as you go through this class. Which gets me started on... The first lecture note packet. The first lecture note packet is the introductory packet. It's 22 pages. I'm going to set the table what the class is going to be about. Now, I 
I, you know, when I first started the class, I did not ask you why you were taking the class because some people think, you know, they by learning valuation, they're going to get rich. Some people think by learning valuation, they can go work for an investment bank. You know, I'm going to tell you why I do valuation. When I first started teaching valuation, I made the mistake of assuming that everybody else was as interested in valuation as I was. Huge mistake in hindsight because most people I've discovered don't care that much about valuation. They don't believe in valuation. Even people who do valuation for a living, say, but they do it all the time. They do it because it's their job. But if you ask them in an honest moment, why is Tesla trading at 172? Their answer is because that's what the market thinks it's worth. If that's what I believe, I couldn't teach this class. So I'll tell you why I do valuation. I'll tell you why I do valuation. I do valuation to fight the lemming. You guys heard of lemmings? <laughs> they became famous or infamous in the 1950s when National Geographic or Disney, nobody's quite sure of the parentage of this movie that was made about lemmings. The thousands of big, ugly, rat-like creatures gathered together on a cliff, run right off the cliff into an ocean and commit collective suicide. I get about 100 emails right after I do this session telling me this is mythology. I don't care. It's good mythology. It's a good story. Go with it. I want you to think about why they do it. Why did they run off the cliff? You can see why the first lemming did it, right? He was going too fast. He couldn't stop. Goes off the cliff into the ocean. Incidentally, these guys can't swim. That kind of seals the deal. Dead. Second guy, too close to the first guy, also dead. But I'd like you to put yourself in the shoes of the very last lemming in that group. I know lemmings don't wear shoes, but kind of hang in there with the analogy anyway. You're running as fast as you can towards a cliff. You've seen your entire tribe disappear up that cliff. You have second thoughts about what you were just planning to do, right? Left brain, right brain, whatever is rash. Like, stop, 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 don't do it. And then you hear this voice in the back of your head. And you know what it said? They must know something that you don't. Remember those seven words. They're the seven most deadly words in investing in valuation. I remember valuing Tesla in November of 2021. At the peak of its glory, you know what the market cap for Tesla was in November of 2021? $1.2 trillion. It had, it had quadrupled in price over the previous year and had gone up like 12-fold over the previous two years. It's trading about $1,200 per share. First time I valued the company, it came up with $300 per share. And then I heard this voice in the back of my head. They must know something that you don't. Speaks in a monotone. Don't ask me why. But you hear those words. Magical things start to happen to your valuation. Your growth rates start to nudge up. Your discount rates start to go down. Your cash flows start to get bigger. It's almost like your spreadsheet has taken on a life of its own. And it's trying to move the value towards price. If you don't believe me, you're going to go through this when you value your company. You're going to come up with a value different price. It's almost like unconsciously you start moving numbers till you get where? Till you get close to the price. It's the safest place to be, actually. It's human nature. In fact, you can divide the world of investors in three groups. First group I call proud lemmings. I'm a lemming and I'm proud to be a lemming. They call themselves momentum investors. But that's what they do, right? What do momentum investors do? They look for a crowd, they join and You're buying, I'm buying. You're selling, I'm selling. Why are you buying? I really don't care. The second group of lemmings I call Yogi Bear lemmings. I used to re read Yogi Bear comics when I was a kid. And Yogi Bear was lived in, I think Yellowstone Park was his domicile, but he was smarter than the average bear. Yogi Bear lemming, lemmings think they're smarter than the average lemming. You know what they want to do? They want to run with the crowd to the very edge of the cliff and then veer away. Great, if you can pull it out, right? You get all the upside. You're tempted. You're saying, I came for an MBA. I'm smarter than the average investor. You might be, but I'm not. I'm not. I can't pull off being a proud lemming. I'm not smarter than the average lemming. I have no idea where the cliff is coming. In hindsight, I can tell you where it happened. If you ask me to describe myself, that's me, lemming with the life vest. That's all I can aspire to be. That's what valuation gives you. It gives you a life vest. It gives you something else to hold on to when everybody else changes their mind. 
it slows the process down for me. I do valuation not because it's going to make me rational. I cannot be rational because human beings are incapable of being rational. But it slows the process down, gives my rational side a chance to mount an argument nine times out of 10. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to ignore it and do whatever I wanted in the first place. But maybe that one time out of 10, it'll bring me to my senses. What I hope to do is throw you that life vest by the end of this class. You can ignore it and still swim out in the middle of the ocean without a life vest. But it's good to have the life vest. Even if you're going with the crowd, might as well have a life vest and then go with the crowd and watch the rest of them drown. So when we start the next class, we're going to talk about what I call the Bermuda Triangle Evaluation. The three biggest reasons why valuation go off the tracks, and none of them have to do with getting cash flows right or the beta right or the cost of capital right. But I'll see you on Wednesday and uh, get ready for the email after class today and another email tomorrow and maybe another email before class on Wednesday. <laughs>